way expanded del x is equal to minus i by square root alpha prime by 2 sum over m alpha m by z to the pi m plus 1. But, and a similar expansion for the anti-holomorphic. Um, now, in this case, alpha 0 was uh, um, where were we? Here. Yeah. Square root alpha prime by 2 PL. Okay. In, in the, the com, non compact, uh, uh, boson alpha 0 was square root alpha prime by 2 times P. Uh, but here you remember that P was, PL and P, right, were different from each other. Okay. And uh, PL was given by n by r plus omega r by alpha prime. Um, there's a similar expansion for uh, the anti-holomorphic guy that involves p right. And you remember that p right was given by n by r minus omega r by alpha prime. Check I've got all the signs right. I think that's right. OK. And if we wanted to, we could uh, integrate this expression. So we get x. This is del x, so therefore contribution only from x left. So x left is equal to, well, there's minus i by square root alpha prime. And then we integrate the alpha 0 guy. That gives us log z. We integrate the, the remaining guy. That gives us minus 1 by m uh, alpha m by z to the power m sum over m. It's alpha prime by 2. And then if we, and then there's an alpha 0 here. And then if we put back what alpha 0 was in terms of this guy, we see we get uh, xl is equal to sum over, um, first let's work out the 0 mode part. Um, the, the 0 mode part is uh, alpha prime by 2 with a minus i times log z, uh, times, uh, times pl, times log z, and then minus minus plus a plus i sum over m, alpha m by mz to the power. OK. This is our final expansion for the x field. And I, OK. There's also the zero mode part of just the position, the guy that's completely constant. You know, when we expanded uh, our, uh, uh, the, the non-compact boson in general, we had x0, something that's just not, just a constant, plus things that depend on sigma and tau, right? So I've not written that part, just, just completely constant. What? Even, even, even for the compact guy, because this, this guy can just be a constant mode, the whole string being at a point and not moving. And that's a solution to the equation of motion. OK. Uh, there is some point we will get into a little trick we use anyway, later. There are, what I've not discussed with you are, are these things called co-cycles. For anyone here who's an expert, I've deliberately suppressed the, this irritating thing. Uh, if there's a question or when we really need it, we will come back to these co-cycles, which involve splitting up the zero mode part into a left and a right piece. OK, so I'm deliberately suppressing the zero, that completely st steady part for now, unless it becomes urgent in question answer, in questioning. OK, uh, we will definitely need to discuss co-cycles carefully at some point. Hopefully not yet now, unless somebody is very uncomfortable. OK, so this, this was the expansion of the field. And L0, the energy, the left moving energy of this mode, well, there was the oscillator part, right? So there was sum over alpha minus n alpha n. Okay, the occupation number of the oscillators, and then there was the part that came from the the zero mode. Maybe you remember this was given by PL squared alpha prime by four, I think, plus this. I'll check. I've got this right. Yeah, perfect. Okay, this is meant to be a. Summary review of what we discussed last time. The important thing that we explained last time was that was this part, which you remember, right? 
It came from the winding sectors. Ws were the winding sectors. Uh, Ns were the kaluza klein momenta. And uh, they split up into left moving and right moving pieces like this. Is, is this clear? Everyone's comfortable with this, right? OK. So our, our, the next thing we're going to do with this, bo with this uh, compact boson is to compute its partition function. OK. So what we're going to do is to compute z. What? Yes. So when we solve CFT, we need the spectrum, we use the dimension, scaling dimension, and the three point, the numerical coefficient associated with three point functions. So if I solve this theory for a particular R, yes. Uh, what will be the? How can I use this T duality? Suppose I solve it for R, and R is a parameter. So then I can solve the CFT for any arbitrary R. So you can solve it for any arbitrary R. Now, one check that you would have is this, that the answer for R, for your solution, has to be equal to the answer for alpha prime by R, at least for things like partition functions. Hmm. For correlation functions, that's also true. Okay? But in there, you may need to change labels for operators. I mean, the main change is basically that W goes to N. Okay? Um, in fact, okay, yeah, uh, is, is this what you were asking? Yeah, how, what will be the use of, how will I use T duality? What prediction can I make? Well, you know, this T duality, just seen as purely world sheet for matter, world sheet, uh, is a very simple statement because it's a, it applies to solvable conformal field theories. So you could solve it for all R and just check that the answer was the same for R as alpha prime by R. Right? If there had been a situation where you, could, where you didn't know how to small, solve it for small r, where you could solve it for r, large r, that would help you predict. But here, here it's, it's just um, uh, something you can check because you can solve it for all r. T duality really becomes um, uh, useful when you think of it in space time. Okay? If you're in a situation where you've got a very small circle, you can analyze string theory exactly there if you know how to solve it. OK? But by doing T duality, you relate this to some very large circle. Now, suppose you want to, you're interested in low energy physics, for instance. You know that low energy physics is governed by Einstein's equations on this very large thing. OK? If you had studied the theory carefully enough, you would have seen that the winding modes in this description coupled together to make a new Einstein equation. But you don't have to worry about that. So you see, you can relate unfamiliar physics to familiar physics. Is this clear? So this is uh, in this context. Now, there are, there are generalizations of, of T-duality, I think something you know very well, um, which sometimes become predictive. Because they relate uh, properties of some manifolds to properties of other manifolds. And then uh, these relations, while are at the level of uh, Conformal field theory also relate, uh, uh, descend to relations of pure geometry, which then mathematicians can check as theorems. Made symmetry, yes. Okay, so, uh, but in this simple case that we're talking about, I would say the main use of it is to allow for, you know, so when we're in very large spaces, we have many techniques to deal with, many approximate techniques to deal with physics. Then. For instance, working with Einstein's equations. That Intuition can be imported to being in small spaces. I would say that was the main. It's not that there was something. You would have been able to derive that stuff anyway if you'd worked hard enough at the conformal field theory. But here, you don't need to worry about that because it, you relate to something you know well. Is this clear? OK. What? Your compactifications, exactly. So making a, a bosonic direction a circle, it's an example of compactification. So in string theory, for instance, um, in the superstring, uh, ten your your world sheet action is the action for ten in the simplest case ten dimensional string theory is ten bosons and fermions. Now you take some of these bosons and make them circles, and now your modes are not propagating in ten dimensions anymore, but could be an R four times T four T six. So that's an example of a compactification. There are more sophisticated compactifications, but this is the simplest example. Okay, uh, other questions? Yes. 
Yes. Uh, the partition function that we found uh, in the Okay, good question. So today we are going to, we already found a partition function for the non-compact boson. Now you might have asked, one way of making your question precise is, could it be that just the condition that is modular invariant and that it comes from a C equals one conformal field theory completely determines this partition function. Okay, today we're going to see counter examples to that claim. Being non-compact. Yes, so there is a claimed classification for all C equals one conformal field theories. And uh, uh, there, for that reason, and in that classification, the unique non-compact theory is the one we, mm -hmm. we deal with. So if you make precise that statement of being non-compact somehow, okay. the unique theory, so it should be that you could get it out. I don't know how practically. Okay. Yeah, but it should be. So this is somehow the same question as this classification. Because if you can classify all conformal field theories, it's like classifying all partition functions. Mm, right. uh, that was not achieved at by looking at partition functions. Right. But the, it sh the answer, I think, should be yes. Right. However, if you just put the condition that it's a C equals one theory, because, you know, the space of CFTs is two lines meeting at a point, right. which we'll discuss at some point for those of you not, not familiar. S space of C equals one conformal field theories. Okay, and uh, uh, what you might hope is to be able to get that classific, that whole thing from this condition. Again, that's effectively the condition, the question of classifying conformal field theories. Right, okay. We know that in G-dimension, yes. massive, delta group for the massive particle is SOD minus Correct. What do you mean by fermion in two dimensions? What do we mean by a fermion in two dimensions? Well, that's a good question. What, what we mean is just something that obeys the Dirac equation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's going to be an anti-commuting field. There is no spin in space. There is no spin. Because as you say, for the simple reason that space is a point. So where do you spin around? Yeah, yeah. There's these lecture notes by Coleman when he discusses Bo Bose Fermi duality in two dimensions. Says, uh, he has this line, which is a very Coleman line, which he says, um, you know, in high dimensions, both Fermi duality seems impossible because of the spin statistics uh, theorem. Um, uh, but uh, uh, this uh, this is not a problem in two dimension for the ex two di dimensions for the excellent reason that in two dimensions there is no spin. <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, okay. So something like that I may not be quoting, but yeah, two meaning of course one plus one. Yeah. But since I see we've lost every condensed matter physicist, I can just say two. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Except, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> every condensed matter student. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. Excellent. So, um, uh, let us consider the partition function. Okay. Now you remember that this theory was identical to the non-compact theory in its oscillator sector. Remember the zero point energy came from the oscillator. Because we got that by taking the zero point energy for, of each of the oscillators and summing them up to derive this magnificent identity, one plus two plus three plus four is equal to minus one by 12. <laughs> Clearly, right? Anyway, <laughs> anyway, so uh, of course you see where that identity came from. It's the part that cannot be canceled by a local counter term. Okay, okay, so, uh, uh, that part all remains unchanged because the oscillators remain unchanged. So that part gave us, if you remember, eta of um, uh, one by eta of tau mod square. You remember this included both the oscillator contributions as well as the zero point energy contribution. That q to the power minus one by 24. Q to the power minus one by 24. Minus one, I mean, the zero point energy was L zero was equal to minus one by 24, right? Okay. Um, and then there was a minus here and then it came down, all, all that stuff, you remember all this, right? 
Okay, what remains is the zero mode sector. Now, let's remember what we got from the zero mode sector for the non-compact boson. I'll just work it out again, just so that we remember it well. Uh, for the non-compact boson, in the zero mode sector, we had alpha prime by two. Remember there was alpha prime by four pi, but the two pi, you, you do the integral over two pi, that cancels the two pi. So alpha prime by two, x zero dot squared. Okay, so this is exactly like, uh, sorry, one by two alpha. It was one over four pi, four alpha, oh, alpha prime. So uh, this is exactly like a particle whose mass is one over alpha prime. A non-relativistic particle whose mass is one over alpha prime. Um, for the non-relativistic particle whose mass was one over alpha prime, we had h is equal to p squared by 2m. Okay? So we have um, L0 then is equal to p squared by 4m. Because L0 plus L0 bar is h. And for the non-compact boson, L0 is equal to L0 bar bar uh, in the zero mode sector. So it was just half and half. Okay, so we have P, uh, so we have L zero is equal to P squared by four M. Okay, we didn't break it up into left movers and right movers, but let me do that now. Okay, so what we want is E to the power minus tau and then two pi. Okay, E to the power minus, oh, let me just say Q to the power. Oh, let me just do the whole thing. Let me just do the whole thing. E to the power minus two, just do it with H. So E to the power minus two pi tau two, the imaginary part of tau, times H. Is this clear? If anything is not clear, you should say. Okay, which was P squared by two M. Clear? And then we did the integral over P, the trace over the Hilbert space, dP by two pi times times the volume of space. Clear? And then you guys help me do this integral. Uh, this is uh, now V by two pi, then we got a square root pi, and then we got whatever was here. So square root of M by pi tau two. Okay, and so that we got V by two pi square root, uh, that was M, but M is alpha prime, so one over uh, alpha prime tau two. Okay, now V is the volume of target space. Um, in one dimension, it's natural, we're gonna be making target space a circle. So the circle has volume two pi r, length. Okay, so we can write this as equal to r divided by square root alpha prime tau two. Okay, so for the non-compact boson, we got uh, one by e tau tau, the whole thing squared, times r by square root alpha prime tau two. Tau two is imaginary part of tau. And you remember that the tau, one over square root tau two played a key role in, in, the, uh, um, in the modular invariance of, of the answer. Okay, the important point was that you had one over square root tau two here, and one over, one over square root of one over tau two there. So the relative, ratio of these two terms was a factor of tau two, which is also what came about in this mod eta squared transformation. Okay, yes. We are a discrete momenta, it's just an IR regulator. You know, so what we're doing is the limit R goes to infinity. Yeah, this was the non-compact. Yeah, now we're turning to the compact. Okay, so now let's work out the compact guy. So the compact guy, so let's say compact. Okay, so in the compact case, we once again have one over eta tau, one square. 
But now, as Nikhil pointed out, we shouldn't be doing an integral, we should be doing a sum. Okay? So first, let's work it out through Hamiltonian methods. Um, you remember that we had our sum now is sum over m and w. w were the winding sectors, and m was the kaluza klein moment. Okay? And here we get q to the power L0. Now, where was L0? L0 was up there. Was alpha prime PL squared by 4. Now, PL was n by r plus omega r by alpha prime. Okay, we've dealt with the zero modes. I'm oh, sorry, the oscillator modes. So we only keep track of the zero modes. Is this clear? Everyone's looking somehow a little blank today. Am I? Is it clear? Or maybe it's, everyone's too far away compared to last time. Uh, is it clear? Okay, excellent. Um, and then there was Q bar to the power alpha prime by four. Uh, and what was this? N by R. N by R minus W by R by alpha prime the whole thing square. Is that clear? This is the answer for the compact case. Yes? I didn't, uh, louder please. That's theta square. No, no, no. I, I, sorry. Sorry. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. We just got the answer there and I put the box too big. Sorry. Is this clear? Yes. Uh, uh, no, we're doing it for both because we've done L0 and L0 bar. If we were doing only XL, we would, yeah. We're doing the full out. Is this clear? Okay. Now, let's work it out. So you see, Q was equal to e to the power 2 pi i tau, which was equal to e to the power 2 pi uh, minus 2 pi tau 2 plus 2 pi i tau 1. Yes? Uh, we are summing over, over. Thank you, let's call this n. N, n. Let's call this n and thank you. What? Momentum and winding. Yes. Okay. So this kind of thing is impeding your understanding. Please point out. So I'm sorry about the um, uh, the sloppiness. Okay. So Q is this. Therefore, Q bar is equal to complex conjugate. So it's e to the power minus two pi tau two minus two pi i tau one. Right. So let's break this up into you know it's tau one and tau two dependences. Clearly, the tau 2 part, the coefficient of minus 2 pi tau 2, is the sum of those two terms. Okay? So we have 1 over e tau of tau mod squared times sum over nw. Then we get e to the power minus 2 pi tau 2, and then the sum of those two terms. So the sum, the cross term cancels. Uh, we get a factor of, uh, so we will get alpha prime by 2 now. And then n squared by r squared plus omega squared r squared by alpha prime squared. That was the tau 2 piece. In tau 1, we will get e to the power 2 pi i tau 1 times the difference. So, uh, plus, now the difference has uh, uh, only cross terms. Cross terms each come with 2, so total there's a factor of 4. There's a 1 by 4 there, so that cancels that 4. Uh, cross term is 1 over alpha prime, but there's an alpha prime, so alpha primes cancel. So we get plus 2 pi i tau 1 uh, nw. Is that clear? Okay, excellent. Um, and so this is our answer. This is our answer. Uh, for the partition function uh, for this compact boson. This is the answer obtained from Hamiltonian methods. But 
there is something very unsatisfying about this answer. Okay? And the thing that's unsatisfying about this answer is that it's not clear that it's modular invariant. Right? This eta function is more or less modular invariant up to this factor of square root tau. Okay? So whatever it multiplies should also be more or less a, a modular invariant up to a factor of that the modular transform should differ from the original by a factor of tau 2. Right, because here the square root tau and the 1 by square root, square root 1 by, now those divide by tau 2. Okay? So it, uh, that, 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 it, that we, the, there should be uh, the same diff, the same ratio of the, fun, of the object and its modular transform as uh, tau 2 and 1 by tau 2, that, that kind of thing. Uh, but it's not, uh, it's not clear that it's working. Okay? It's not clear that it's working because the tau dependence of this looks pretty complicated and you try to do a tau goes to 1 by tau. Uh, it, in this form, it'll just be a mess. You could try, but it would just be a mess. Okay? However, here, you see, what was the reason we believed that the answer was uh, modular invariant? It was that the Euclidean partition function for this theory was a geometrical function of the, the structure of the torus. Okay? So if we could massage this answer into the form we would get, not by doing a Hamiltonian calculation, by doing a, but by doing a Euclidean path integral com computation. Then it would be guaranteed to give it a, uh, then it would be guaranteed to be modular invariant if we did it right. Okay? Now it's often the case that computations you do using Hamiltonian methods and computations you do using um, path integral methods give you the same answer but in different descriptions. Okay? And just to illustrate that, um, uh, just to illustrate that, uh, just to illustrate that to you, in uh, 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 in a simpler context, we're going to take five minutes off and work out a simpler problem. Okay, the simpler problem is this: suppose my Lagrangian, suppose my action is non-relativistic quantum mechanics. I've got m by two x dot squared. Okay, and x is equal to x plus two pi r. Okay? Now, if I asked you what is the partition function of this, uh, what is the partition function of this, uh, thermal partition function of this theory? If I asked you what the thermal partition function of the theory was, all of you would tell me, well, you know, the states of this theory are labeled by momentum, but momentum has to be n by r. The Hamiltonian is p squared by 2m, and so z is equal to sum over n e to the power minus n squared by r squared p squared by 2m. So 2m minus 1 by 2, 2m sum over yeah, n squared by r squared. Right? With a beta. Trace e to the power minus beta h. Z is equal to this would be this. Is this clear? Well, this is what all of you would say. Now, let us try to get the same answer using path integral techniques. Using Feynman's path integral for this, uh, for this problem. Yeah. So we all know that you know, the translation to path integrals of being finite temperature is to do a path integral in Euclidean space over a circle whose uh, circumference is beta. Because e to the power minus beta h is moving by beta Except that would have been the case if it had been e to the power i beta h. The minus is moving by beta in the Euclidean direction. Right? All this is familiar. So what we have to do is to do, uh, what, uh, what we're going to try to do is to recover this answer uh, from dx e to the power minus m x dot squared by 2, okay, uh, d tau, in a theory where tau is equal to tau plus beta. Because the temperature is a compactification of your time. Okay. So, 
just as we discussed last time in class. You see, this problem here is very similar to the problem we really want to consider, except that instead of being a string, it's a particle, so it's a bit simpler. So it's a bit easier, we have let train our intuition there, then we go back to the string. Okay? So, now if we were doing the path integral, we have to sum over all maps from the circle to the circle. The first circle had circumference beta, the second circle had circumference 2 pi r. Clearly these maps are labeled by winding numbers. Okay? Uh, I'm going to use m for winding number so that we don't confuse with this w, which is totally different. That's winding in space. This is winding in time. In Hamiltonian picture, there was no winding. There was just momentum. Okay, it's not a string we're looking at. There's no real winding. But in the Euclidean path integral, now there's a winding. Is this clear? Mm, it's related, and we'll see the relationship now, but it's not exactly that simple. They're related by Poisson resummation. You'll, you'll see. Okay. Okay. So, therefore, if we want to do this path integral, we have to do this path integral as a sum over path integrals over the different winding sectors. So, we do the, the sum over the mth sector. This, this path integral. But you know, now, in the mth sector, if I just, I can do this, the path integral over the mth sector in a very simple way. I choose one solution that has winding number m and look at fluctuations around that. Since my one solution is winding number m, all fluctuations should have periodic boundary conditions because that one solution is already accounting for the wind. So all the fluctuations around that should be periodic. Therefore, the fluctuations around this are the same in every sector. Okay? So if we look, we do the path integral in the sector with winding, uh, winding m, all we have to do is to find one classical solution of the equation of motion, which has winding m. Okay? And then the remaining fluctuations the action will be the action for this one solution plus the action for fluctuations. Why is it that simple? Well, because we're solving around, a, a we're expanding around a solution to the equation of motion, so there's no linear term in it. And the whole action was quadratic. And there's, of course, an obvious solution, which is the guy that is x is equal to beta, no, sorry. Uh, 2 pi r by beta tau and m, 2 pi r m tau by beta. Clearly, as tau goes to tau plus beta, this, pick, this goes to 2 pi r m. It's a solution because it's linear in tau. Okay, therefore, the solution to the equations of motion, which is acceleration is equal to zero, is obeyed. Okay, and therefore, what we get is an overall path integral over the fluctuations, which for th these fluctuations, for the, uh, for which we'll come back to in a moment. So let's first look at this. There's this overall path integral, and then there's the sum over m. Okay. Now, the overall, okay, first let's do the sum over l and, and then we'll look at the overall. What is the sum over, oh my God, there's a mass here as well. Uh, Let's call this uh, R. No, R you won't be able to see. What? S. Make mass capital. Make mass capital. Good. Okay, there's a sum over M. So now we get, just plug this guy into this action. So we get uh, e to the power minus capital M, uh, 2 pi R, the whole thing squared, by beta squared. But then the integral over beta, uh, sorry, yeah, we got that right, right? And m, uh, m squared. But the integral over beta gives us a beta, factor of beta. Okay? So this is whatever this is times sum over m, e to the power minus capital M times uh, 
2 pi r m the whole thing squared by beta. Okay. Now let's deal with this guy. Please. Homotopy class, absolutely. One homotopy class. How are the fluctuations the same in each homotopy class? Let's 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 see that. You see, let's say we're homotopy class for those of you who don't know is just winding up. Okay. So suppose we take x in the mth winding sector. Uh, okay, and write it as this thing, the so two pi r m tau by beta plus x tilde, okay, of tau, whatever it is. Now, we have to do the path integral over all x's that obey the fact that it winds m time as you go around. This guy winds m times as you go around, and therefore this guy has to wind zero times. So it's the same for all homotopy class. Okay, it's cr crucial here that the action was quadratic. Because then the, it's not just that these configurations are the same, the action for them is also the same. Up to this overall factor. Is that clear? Sir. Yes. I don't understand the winding concept here. Winding concept here. Okay, you see, what are we supposed to do? We are supposed to do a path integral over for on Euclidean space. Euclidean space is that time is Euclidean and is a circle. And we are supposed to integrate over all x of tau's. All x of tau's that are legal. But our x itself is a periodic field. Okay? So imagine Imagine that you've got a circle, this is time, okay? And you've got another circle, this is x. We want to integrate over all maps. All, you see, because what we have is x of tau. So tau was this circle, x was this circle. So what we're doing is integrating over all functions from a circle to a circle, or all maps from a circle to a circle. Now, you see that one particular map from the circle to a circle is one that when you go around the circle in tau, you come back to the same point in x. But that's not the only legal map. Because as you go around the circle in tau, you can also come back to x after a two pi r rotation. Okay, you can imagine it this way. Imagine that there is like a steel hoop. That's your tau. And imagine that you have a rubber string that you start at some point, do whatever you want and end at the same point and then you glue up. So one way is you do, your rubber string does this, well, no, I'm not rubber, whatever, so a string of a twine of as long length as you want. So it doesn't sort of want to come back. One way is that you take your twine and it goes like this, it comes back. Another way is that the twine can go round and join. Another way is the twine can go two times round and join. Okay. It's just the same thing as what we talked about last time X in mathematics, except the physical co connotation is different. Now the winding is not in a spatial direction. It's in this fictional Euclidean time direction. There's no Euclidean time. It's just an artifact for computation. But in the mathematics, it's there. Lifting spaces, I don't even know what that is. Covering space. But this is... Uh, more simple than that. It is just maps from a circle to a circle. This yeah. One one, right? X tilde, x tilde, x tilde obeys x tilde of 0 is equal to x tilde of, say, of beta. It has, it's not one, to one. one to one, nothing is one to one. All these x's can go up and down, up, up and down. One to one is not relevant. Okay. Yes. That's just for convenience. That's for convenience. If you'd done something else, you would have got apparently a different kind of expansion in each sector. But you can shift to this yeah. so that, yeah, this is the, 
this is what makes the simplicity of the problem manifest. Okay, excellent. Sir, yes. So, uh, does the winding number affect the momenta of uh, like n also? Uh, we have to see what the relationship between winding number and n is. In the path integral description, there's no momentum. There's only winding. Uh, but when we were doing earlier, there was this n over r and. Uh, uh, the point of this exercise is to see the relationship between the, those. So hang on for five minutes. We, we'll get there. X is periodic. That's because X is periodic, we're doing the sum over M. M is the winding of X around beta. That's coming periodic from beta, but then X is also periodic, right? X goes No, X, big, it's not coming purely from beta. If X was not periodic, then X could not have wound. The, the, the winding is happening because both are periodic. It's a map from a circle to a circle. That was what is important. Had it not been the case that X was periodic, had it been that X was uh, non-periodic, had it been that the boundary conditions in X was that X of beta is equal to X of zero, then there's no winding. You see, the reason that we could get more general boundary conditions than X of zero is equal to X of beta, physically, beta zero and beta are the same point. So the field should come back to itself when, X, when, when we've gone from zero to beta. So had there been no periodicity in X, the boundary condition would have been X of zero and is equal to X of beta. Is this clear? Here we have that the boundary condition is X of beta minus X of zero is 2 M pi R. Because of the periodicity of X. Is this clear, Nick? So what you're saying is, uh, like, if you go from zero to beta, yes. Uh, there will come a point like from 0 to beta where like let's say beta by 2 uh, where x0 will map to x, x0 plus 2 pi r and that At, uh, no x x0 x of 0 is equal to x of beta plus 2 pi r 2 pi r m ah you you say suppose as m winding then there will be a 2 pi r then a 2 uh, 2 2 pi r yes 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 Yes, but there may be many points like yeah, that. Be, be because the, the guy can go, whoosh, whoosh, whoosh. It, has to be, it doesn't have to be one to one. Yeah. The only thing that you care about is that once you go all around, you've wound a total of m times. You can go back forth, back forth, do anything you want. But at the end, you have to have wound a total of m times. Is this clear? OK? Nigel? Okay, good that you are asking. It's much better than seeing you guys looking blank. Okay, so please, please do this, yes. Okay, now let's go back to this guy. Now that we've had this extended discussion, it's clear to everyone what this guy is. You see, because this guy was the path integral and X tilde. X tilde obeyed the boundary conditions. So while X obeyed the boundary conditions, X of beta is equal to X of zero plus two pi R M. X tilde obeys the boundary conditions. X tilde of beta is equal to X tilde of 0 plus 0. But this is exactly the same boundary condition we would get for a non-compact boson. Because there's no periodicity. It has to come back to itself. And therefore, this guy is the partition function for the non-compact boson. Is this clear? OK. And therefore, this guy is what we worked out. Uh, OK, we didn't work out. OK, we'll work out. Uh, now, it's, we've worked out, but OK, p squared by 2n beta minus e to the power uh, d, uh, dp by 2 pi into 2 pi r. Okay, into volume. Let's call this just the volume. Volume of x. Okay, 2 pi r. Integral. Okay. And therefore is equal to r into square root pi into square root of 2m by beta.
Okay. And so this is equal to r into square root 2 pi m by beta. Is this clear? Okay. So now our answer is given. Z we claim is equal to r into 2 pi m by beta into sum of, oh, this is m. Sorry, this is m. Mass. Okay. Into sum over e to the power minus m into 2 pi r m. The whole thing squared by beta. Is this clear? Okay, excellent. But now we have a puzzle because this is one expression. This is the path integral expression. But we had a second expression which was z is equal to um, sum over n e to the power minus beta p squared by 2m. So n squared by 2r squared uh, m. So we've got two different expressions for the same object. And they look pretty different if you just look at them. Okay, on the plus side, both are sums of Gaussians. On the minus side, the arguments of the Gaussians are different. You know, uh, there's a capital M in the numerator and beta in the denominator in the first. There's a capital M in the denominator and beta in the numerator in the second. Okay, they just look like different expressions. Now, so what's the resolution to this quote unquote paradox? So the resolution to this paradox is very simple. It's that there's a mathematical identity between these two things. And it's a mathematical identity that you're familiar with. It's called Poisson resummation. So let me remind you what Poisson resummation is. Poisson resummation is the following, uh, following claim. That suppose I've got some function f and I define f tilde as equal to e to the power i 2 pi kx f of x integral dx. So Fourier transform, but uh, you know with a particular choice of this normalization and a particular scale of momentum with a 2 pi. Okay, then Poisson resummation is the claim that f of m sum over m is the same um, equals minus infinity to infinity is the same as sum over n f, f of n. There are some conditions for the function to obey this, but reasonable functions like Gaussians definitely obey it. Okay, sums over integers of the function are same as sums over, sums over the function at integer values, same as sum over the Fourier transform at integer. This is the claim of Poisson resolution. Mm. Uh, just before coming to class, I looked up Poisson resummation on Wikipedia to get these two pi i's. <laughs> okay. I, that's hard to remember, you know. <laughs> but, okay. Uh, fine. Now I'm claiming that this identity helps us relate that to that. Let's check that's the case. Okay, you see, this guy is a sum over, let's choose one of them, let's say this guy. Let's call that f of x, f of n. So suppose we say that f of x is equal to e to the power minus beta by m x squared by 2r squared. Then this term here is this side, okay? So, I want to find the left hand side. So, I have to work out the Fourier transform. So, what am I supposed to do? I'm supposed to work out f tilde, which is equal to e to the power 2 pi i k x e to the power minus beta by m x squared by 2 r squared. 
and I'm supposed to integrate over x. Okay, so I'm going to get two terms. I mean, there are two things. There's the determinant, and that's, that's what I get from completing the square. Let's work out the determinant first. Determinant gives us factor of square root pi, square root pi, and then square, uh, square root of whatever this stuff is. So 2r squared m by beta square root. Right, so um, that we can write as, I'll take the r out, so that's 2 r into square root of 2 pi m by beta. Looking good, right? Okay, then there's the completing the square. Uh, okay, uh, completing the square is always a pain in the neck. Right. So uh, let's see. So we will get, first we will get, uh, yeah, so we will get a half because there was a half here. Then we'll get this square by this, right? Help me get that right. Uh, is it 2 pi i k, the whole thing, square divided by, by beta m into 2 r square? No, no. Yeah. I'm sorry, let, let me, if we have ax squared plus bx, uh, let's write 2bx. Say we have a, uh, yeah, suppose we have ax squared by 2 plus bx, we will do what? Take a out. So x by, x squared by 2 plus b by a x, and then, uh, then we'll write this as out as well, so 2b by a, and then we'll complete the squares, so we'll make this a by 2 into x plus b by a, the whole thing squared, minus b squared by a squared, okay, and so the term, that, so the remaining term is e to the palm, the thing after you've completed the square, is e to the palm minus b squared by 2a. Okay, so I should identify b squared by 2a. Minus b squared by 2a. Okay, so what was my b? Uh, let me write this again. What was my b? It was uh, 2 pi i, 2 pi i k, so 4 pi squared minus 1, so the minus is going to cancel this minus, so I won't write it, k squared divided by 2, uh, by 2a. So I've already got the 2, and then a was beta m by r, uh, r squared up here. Okay. Oh, and this whole thing had a minus. So this thing comes with a plus. We had e to the power minus something. So this will come with a minus. Okay, now is it working? Uh, that thing has a capital M up here, so that's correct. It has a beta down there, so that's correct. Uh, yeah, K is replaced by M, R squared is correct. Four pi squared is correct, but I seem to be off by half. Right, I'm getting an extra half. Yeah. Um, ah, ah, ah. And that is because my action was had an, no, did I take that into account, x dot squared by two? Yeah, we've omitted the x dot squared by two in the action. The action was m x dot squared by two. So when we computed the action for the winding number, should have been m x dot squared by two. Right, so sorry. This, yeah, I just wrote x dot squared times beta, right? So there was a by two, sorry. Okay. And so then it matches perfectly.
Is this clear? Okay. So uh, the winding in the time direction was a fake. It's a mathematical trick for the Euclidean path integral. Either you have a sum over windings or you have a sum over momenta, but not both. Now you can ask, what is the relationship between the momentum and the winding? That's the, roughly speaking, the question you asked. You say, it's not like momentum is some function of y. These two things are like Fourier transforms of each other. You never have momentum and winding in the same description. Is this clear? You do the sum over all windings or sum over all momenta. It's hard to say what one mo momentum is in terms of one winding or vice versa. Is this clear? Okay, so this is a general feature. Oftentimes, path integral and Hamiltonian representations of physics are interchanged by a Poisson resummation. Okay, so this we've seen in a very simple example, and we got all you know our factors right. Now, yes. Yes, so these two expressions, as you say, both are exact for every beta, but one of them is useful. The partition, the Hamiltonian method is use, useful at low temperature. Because you see, that's the sum over exponentials, each of which get a, uh, quickly smaller and smaller if beta is large. So the low temperature, the, the, if you want a quick approximation to the answer at low temperatures, use the first expression, the Hamiltonian expression. If you want a quick approximation to the answer at high temperatures, use the second expression. So these, as, as was pointed out here, these two expressions were both in principle exact, lend themselves to different convenient approximation schemes. That was your question, right? Excellent. Okay. So now let's return to the problem at hand. So the, the problem, in the problem at hand, We've got this, which we got from the Hamiltonian method. We want to convert it to the expression we would get from the path integral method. Now, winding in space is winding in space, both for Hamiltonians and path integrals. What is the difference between path integrals and Hamiltonians? Path integral yes, should be interchanged for winding in time. Okay? So, uh, now let's, uh, let's do the same thing that we did before. Okay, what we want to do is to take at fixed w, we want to take the sum over n e to the power minus 2 pi tau 2 alpha prime by 2 n squared by r squared. I'm not touching this term because it has no n. Okay, uh, plus 2 pi i tau 1 n w. I want to take this and Poisson resum it. So what am I supposed to do? I'm supposed, so this was some function of n, right? So that function was e to the power minus 2 pi tau 2 alpha prime by 2 x squared by r squared plus 2 pi i tau 1 x w, right? Now I'm supposed to Fourier transform this function. So f tilde is equal to integral e to the power 2 pi i k x times minus 2 pi tau 2 alpha prime by 2 x squared by r squared plus 2 pi i tau 1 x w. Right, and I'm supposed to do the integral dx. Find x tilde and then sum over all its integer values. Clear? Okay. Now, first thing we see is this. Um, first thing we see is this, that here k, this 2 pi i x, 2 pi i x, there's a k plus tau 1 w. So let's write that as, but 2 pi i x into k plus tau w. Hmm. Uh, 
and uh, then there is minus 2 pi uh, tau 2 alpha prime by r squared and then x squared by 2. That would be k plus tau 1. Tau 1, thank you. Okay, and now we do the same shebang. Okay, we do the Gaussian integral. So we get square root pi, then we get square root 2 from this, square root r squared by 2 pi tau 2 alpha prime. Okay, and then we have exponential of, and we're supposed to do b squared by 2a. So b squared is k plus tau 1 w, the whole thing squared, 4 pi squared. We know that the mi i's cancel, so minus signs work out. So we did that by 2a. So 2 pi tau 2 r squared, and there's a 2. That's it, a and half. Alpha prime I missed. Uh, a has a, it's alpha prime here. Good. Okay, so the, we get square root 2 pi, square root 2 pi cancel, r squared, so r by square root tau 2 alpha prime, sum over exponential of, okay, and uh, now what will we get? Um, This has to be replaced by integers. So we had sum over n and w there, so let me call that m. So m plus minus m plus tau 1 w, the whole thing square, uh, 2 pi, 2 pi by tau 2 alpha prime r. Hmm. And then there was that term which I just didn't touch up there. R squared. R squared, thank you. And then there was the term which was minus 2 pi tau 2 w squared r squared by alpha prime squared. Right? Alpha prime by 2, thank you. Alpha prime by 2, so let's pi. Was this, a, were, it was this, alpha prime. Okay, now, yep. Which one, this one? This was a pi. Ah. Yeah, two pi. As long as I got it right here. No, that is half. You're right. Pi. Because this half. No, no. Four. Oh. Four pi. Was that really four pi square? It was probably four times pi square. Where did it come from? Uh, just a minute. Uh, where did it come from? Sorry. Two pi. Yeah. Two pi. And this is just pi. Thank you. Okay, excellent. Okay, now let me first compare with what Pulchinski has. Uh, Okay, now Polchinsky writes the answer as this form. He writes 2 pi, then r, then z, z x, which is the non-compact boson, times sum over m and w uh, e exponential of minus pi r square mod m minus w 
tau mod square by alpha prime tau 2. Okay, let's try to compare all factors. This is equal to this question mark. Let's first look up in the exponent. If we take this pi r squared, okay, this is r, pi r squared, we just expand this out. This guy is m minus w tau 1, the whole thing squared. Okay, minus w, his w and my w are opposite to each other. That you'll forgive me. It's a, his m minus is my m plus w. Fine. m plus tau 1 w, the whole thing squared by this. That's matching perfectly, right? Pi r squared alpha prime tau 2. What? I understand. That's why I'm doing real plus imaginary squared. So I took the real part squared plus imaginary part squared. So this first term here was the real part squared. Perfect match. Imaginary part squared is omega tau 2, the whole thing squared. But there was an alpha prime tau 2 here. So tau 2, so it becomes tau, that's good. Pi is good. R squared is good. W squared is good. Alpha prime is good. So it's just exactly the same. So this quantity here can be written in this form. Okay, and uh, does somebody in their notes have what we got for this non-compact boson? I know, but if somebody has it, it's, it's faster. Yeah, so Pulchinski is rem removing the V. So he had 1 over 2 pi alpha prime two, uh, tau 2. So, so that, remember, 1 over 2 pi, pi alpha prime tau 2. Square root alpha prime tau 2. Okay, so this is perfect. Because it's 2 pi r times 1 over uh, 2 pi alpha prime, square root alpha prime tau 2. So this is exactly his answer. Okay. Now, so this is an answer. The reason we went through this whole complicated, um, uh, complicated derivation was that we wanted, if you remember, was we wanted to check modular invariants. Okay? Already we've got one nice thing from modular invariants. Because we've got this factor of square root tau 2 was the same as the factor of 1 over square root tau 2 that appeared in the non-compact boson answer. Okay? That's why we could club this together to the non-compact boson answer. This by itself was modular invariant. So all that we need to show that, that it's modular invariant is that the sum is modular invariant. Okay? It's easy to check that, but before we check that, before we check that, I'm going to give you a physical interpretation of the terms in the sum. Suppose we have, I want to convince you that that's what comes out of a path integral calculation. Okay? So, you see, this is the same kind of thing we did on that blackboard, except now we have two winds. We have our x winding in the spatial direction. We also have our x winding in the time direction. So, we want, we're going to turn the sum over in the path integral, instead of having sum over windings in space and momenta in time, we have sum over windings in space and winding in time. Winding in space is W, that has not changed. Clearly, this M should be the winding in time. Okay? So, if we were doing a path integral computation, we would do it on the string the same way that we did for the particle. We would find the simplest solution, the linear kind of solution, and expand around that. So we will get this kind of sum times something universal. That something universal will be that for the free boson, the non-compact boson. That's the structure we're getting. So it'll all work if the path integral reproduces what we have in that sum over exponentials. So all we have to do is to check that the action for this linear solution that implements both windings 
is just that a, a minus pi r squared, blah, blah, blah. So let's check that. First, what is this linear solution? Clearly, we have to have x is equal to a times sigma plus b times tau, because it's linear. And then two things have to happen. When we take sigma to sigma plus 2 pi, the solution should wind w times. So the solution should be such that sigma goes to sigma plus 2 pi makes x go to x plus 2 pi r. Okay? But it should also be that when tau goes to tau plus tau 2, imaginary part of tau. Um, we shouldn't use tau for both. Let's call it t. t is the time, time point. t goes to t plus tau 2. And sigma goes to sigma, sorry, 2 pi tau. And sigma goes to sigma plus 2 pi tau 1. Remember, we have this kind of torus. So the first cycle is just like this. The second one was this tilted guy. The second identification has tau going to tau two plus 2 pi tau 2, t goes to t plus 2 pi tau 2, and sigma going to sigma plus 2 pi tau 1. Okay? Under this combined identification, x should go to x plus 2 pi, sorry, this was w. Is this clear? No. Ah, no, yeah, the sigma plus 2 pi tau. This is 2 pi. This is 2 pi tau 2. This is 2 pi tau. Is this clear? So for the second cycle, you have to do this 2 pi tau 2 and 2 pi tau 1. But for the first cycle, it's just 2 pi. Okay? Excellent. And so... And so we find what? We need that sigma goes to sigma plus 2 pi, uh, two pi uh, gives you x goes to x plus, and therefore a should be equal to, this has to be equal to, any idea what's going on? Okay, okay, <laughs> okay. Uh, okay, so A has to be equal to uh, WR, right? So that sigma goes to sigma plus 2 pi will give, you, uh, give us X goes to X plus uh, 2 pi WR, okay? Also, it should be, so, so we'll put WR here. Now, let's get the second equation. So, if we do WR into 2 pi tau 1 plus uh, b into 2 pi tau 2 uh, is equal to 2 pi mr. So 2 pi is cancelled everywhere. Uh, and therefore b is equal to wr tau 1 minus mr divided by B. Is this okay? MR minus uh, yeah, MR. Yes, you're right. MR minus W tau WR. So M M minus W, what? Sorry, let's do it again. M minus W tau 1 into R divided by 2 tau 2, by tau 2. Right? Okay. And so our solution was this, and now all that remains is to compute the action. Okay, 
So the action is x prime square, x dot squared plus x prime squared because it's Euclidean it's plus, 1 by 4 pi alpha prime, d2 sigma, x dot squared is uh, omega r the whole thing squared, uh, sorry, that was x prime, uh, x prime squared was this, yes, x dot squared is uh, plus m minus omega tau 1 by tau 2, the whole thing squared into r squared. And uh, uh, okay, then we have to, then we have to multiply with the area of this torus, which is 2 pi into 2 pi tau 2. So we get, right, it's a parallelogram. So into 2 pi squared tau 2, and then we had 1 over 4 pi alpha prime in the action. So 4 pi alpha prime. Oof, I find it very hard to think. Anyway. <laughs> okay. Okay. So, uh, so then we get pi tau 2 by alpha prime. Um, omega squared r squared. Uh, sorry, r squared outside. Omega squared plus m minus omega tau 1 by tau 2 x squared. Uh, and there's some alpha prime. Ah, okay, looks pretty good, right? 1 by alpha prime, pi tau 2 by, uh, pi tau 2 by alpha prime uh, overall, r squared overall. Yeah, it's exactly the same. Okay, so this, that, that quantity that appeared in the exponent there, in the expanded form, it was easier to see, is exactly the action that we get from this, from this double winding configuration for the string. Okay, so this was, uh, that you got the path integral expression out of the Hamiltonian expression was point number one. Okay, uh, yeah. Does this group of quotient of quotient resummation always work or is it? There's no, there are no guarantees. That are for a free theory, it works. Okay. Yeah. Uh, however, you know, um, in supersymmetric computations, different computations, dual computations, give things that by, for functions related by different, um, you know, by various uh, dualities. Many of these function relations are morally similar to Poisson resummation. It's not always Poisson resummation itself. Sometimes we discover new mathematical identities between functions because two ways of computing supersymmetric indices are, have to be the same thing. And then you, you check on Mathematica to 100th order, they are the same. And then your mathematician friend proves this. <laughs> okay, yeah. Okay, excellent. Yeah, uh, given the situation, let's end early today. Um, the last thing I wanted to say uh, is uh, um, about modular invariants. Okay, so about modular invariance, all the, now, this quantity I'm claiming is modular invariant. If you do tau, okay, first, let's check modular invariance under tau goes, tau 1 goes to tau 1 plus integer, okay? That, under tau 1 goes to tau 1 plus integer, that is clearly modular invariant because if we take tau 1 to tau 1 plus integer, it's effectively, uh, shifting m by w, right, because, okay, and uh, w, uh, m was a dummy variable, so you shifted by w, you get the same answer. Clearly, under tau 1 goes to tau 1 plus integer, it's invariant. Okay, what about tau goes to 1 by tau? Okay, under tau goes to 1 by tau, it's more interesting, so let's work it out. Minus 1 by tau. Okay, so we have m minus w tau divided by uh, alpha prime. So alpha prime, of course, not going to play any role. So mod tau two square. Okay, so now let's do tau goes to uh, minus one by tau. 
Okay. So we get m tau um, plus w mod square divided by tau mod square tau 2. Uh, oh, and uh, we've done we've done the transformation on tau. We should also do the trans transformation on uh, tau two prime. Okay. Um, so, okay. So what have I done here? Let me be more systematic. Yeah. Suppose we compute m minus w tau prime by tau two prime mod square, where tau prime is equal to minus one by tau two. Uh, minus 1 by tau. Let's immediately work out what tau 2 prime is. Okay. So tau prime is minus 1 by tau. So uh, uh, is equal to 1 by tau 1 plus i minus 1 by tau 2, which is equal to minus tau 1 minus i tau 2 by tau 1 plus i tau 2 square. which is equal to tau 2, so tau 2 prime. So tau 2 prime is equal to tau 2 divided by mod tau square. OK. And uh, so now when we compute this, we get mod, tau, this is tau m minus w mod square by tau prime sorry, by tau mod square into, but according to this, tau 2 divided by tau mod square. It's the same thing as long as maybe there's a plus here. As long as you, you switch m and w, perhaps with a minus sign. Right? So under the shift of dummy variables, this thing clearly goes over to the same thing. So as expected, modular invariance was trivial to see from the path integral form of the, uh, of the expression because the path integral was obviously modular invariant. But in order to see modular invariant, we, or invariance, we needed to convert to this path integral form. OK, I suggest we continue with fermions tomorrow. I'm finding this a bit hard. <laughs> yeah. Uh, sorry. Oh, now choose. So I suggest we end class here. Uh, questions, comments, if you have any. Tuesday, unfortunately, there's a meeting that I cannot get out of, so I will not uh, be taking class. Our next class will be Friday. It's coming Friday. Uh, questions or comments? Uh, I have a yes. Could you delete the text of the, the string where it's winding around? So yes. Like, a string cannot break and like wind it, like, a string was winding once. Yes. It cannot break and wind twice. Yes. So these are physically distinct sectors. These are different sectors. Yes. Um, yeah, uh, you know, the partition function of the theory includes all sectors. So for instance, um, if you focused on, let's say, winding number zero and somehow projected onto, you know, winding zero on that side, that would be consistent. That would be the same as uh, working with just the uh, non-compact boson. Yeah. But if you try to focus on a sector with a particular winding number, that would not be consistent. Because in the operator product expansion, when you take the fusion of two operators, you would produce an another operator with another binding. OK? So it's very much like saying that you know states in a theory, charge is conserved. So let me try to focus on things with a particular charge. The problem is the charge is conserved, but it's not locally conserved in the sense that, you know, you can produce two electrons here and two anti-electrons there and it's still good. So in local physics, you need to be able to take a charge field and another charge field that produce a field of twice the charge. To try to truncate your field spectrum to things with charge only one will be inconsistent. That's what we will be doing here at the level of vertex operators if you try to truncate only one. You will violate closure of the OP. Okay. 
Uh, excellent. Other questions or comments? Okay, let's let's uh, stop for today.